Is this on? Yay, okay. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, it is lovely to see you all on this beautiful but cold day. Um, a couple announcements. Next week is Easter, and we have Easter sunrise service is going to be at 7.30 a.m., and following that, we will have a breakfast. Uh, you do not need to bring anything except yourself, um, so no need to worry about rushing out super early in the morning and having to bring breakfast. So just show up 7.30, uh, and then the Easter ser worship service will be at 9.30. Tomorrow we have a, uh, a session meeting. Uh, there was a date change from last week to this week, so uh, if you have anything you need to talk to session about, that will be tomorrow at 6 p.m. And let's see, what else do I have here? Next Sunday, at 6 p.m., uh, Christ Prez will be hosting a uh, choral concert, and they have invited all of us to join. So if you would like to uh, come out next Sunday night and listen to some music on Easter, that'll be at 6 o'clock here at the church. And other than that, the next Missionary Society meeting will be April 18th. Okay. And our call to worship for today comes from Psalm 118, uh, verse 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And um, ways to give at Center Church, uh, we are not currently passing plates. So uh, if you would like to give your offering, you can give online. Uh, or as you exit the church, there is a box on the right-hand side. Uh, if you all pray with me, please. Blessed are you, Lord God, our Father, and the one who comes in your name. Like the palms laid down on a road long ago, we lay down our gifts our time and our talents, Lord, that you may use them as you see fit to ready this world for your coming. Amen. Good morning. Beautiful Palm Sunday. It's a good day the Lord made for us. Thank you. Our first hymn will be All Glory, Glad, and Honor, page 282, verses 1, 2, and 3. Our next hymn is number 281, verses 1 and 3. Praise him, praise him.
Next is 264, crown him with many crowns, verses 1 and 2. Our fourth hymn is number 525, His Name is Wonderful. Please be seated. Will you join me in prayer? Merciful Father, as we enter into Holy Week, we intentionally turn our thoughts to Jerusalem to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who invites us into a relationship with you, that we may one day enter in triumph the city not made by human hands, but Lord, the new Jerusalem, where we have the pleasure and, and joy of living with you forever. And Father, even as we look forward to that day with great joy, we remember the harsh truths of living in a world separated from you. And we ask once again for your healing hand. There are so many, Lord, in our congregation and, and beyond who need your healing touch, whether it be physically, emotionally, or spiritually. And we remember Father Carson Kroll, Ray Benedict, Virginia Riddle, Joanne Mershimer, Kevin Connor, Harold McDowell, Ed Palmer, Ginny Richardson, George Duncan, Glenn Bickle, Carol George, Carolyn McCandless, Linda Miller, Linda Wall, Vonnie Hoffman, and Father, all those who aren't listed here, but who we know need your healing hand. And Father, you know each and every one of their needs more intimately than we or any doctor could. Father, we ask that you would just place your healing hand here on our congregation, 
in our community and across the world. Rain your mercy down upon us, your people. Turn our hearts towards you each day and fill us with the faith that can only result in action in your name. We ask all this in the name of our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. It will come as you as no surprise that today is Palm Sunday. What gave you the clue? Was it the palms in the back of the screen? Was it the hymns we sang? Was it your calendar? Welcome to worship on this Palm Sunday. And I'm going to assume that for most of us, this is not our first Palm Sunday. And for me, as the new pastor in the congregation, I'm not sure how many Palm Sunday sermons you've heard. None of mine. I don't want to insult your intelligence. Stories fairly simple easily understood, and you'll remember. But while it's familiar, I would encourage you not to consider it trite or unimportant. It is a significant event in the life of Jesus Christ and therefore in the life of the church. For us, it's the beginning of Holy Week. For Jesus, it was the beginning of the last week of his life. Those of us who were born in the last century are cognizant of the fact that this might be our last Palm Sunday. What Jesus was doing was intentional, and it had implications not just for his disciples, not just for the people who were joining him in this Palm Sunday procession. It has implications for every member of the Church of Jesus Christ and beyond that, for every person in the world, past, present, or future. It's Palm Sunday. I call your attention to the fact that this event has been recorded in all four of the Gospel writers. And there's differences between their accounts. But those differences assure us that they are true and that they are accurate. If after church we went outside and were unfortunate enough to see an accident out front, each of us who saw it would be able to tell something. But our stories would be different because of what we focused on, how we felt, what we were looking at. True, but incomplete. This morning, we're going to be looking at Matthew's account of what took place. It's Matthew chapter 21. In the Pew Bibles, it's on page 1,531. I'd encourage you to follow along, although, as I said, I'm not going to be dealing with the details, although I would love to do that. Hear the Word of God recorded by Matthew in his account of an event that he was a participant in. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage in the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. 
This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Here ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for inspiring the authors of the 66 books of the Bible and through what they wrote, revealing who you are and what your will is for us. This morning, on this significant holiday in the life of the church, we'd ask that you would speak to us through your word, that we might understand what it was that Jesus was intentionally trying to communicate, especially to those of us here today who want to learn. We'll give you thanks and praise in advance in Christ. Amen. The journey to Jerusalem included a lot of people. Do you know why they were in this procession? They were fulfilling the obligation that every Jewish male had to travel to Jerusalem three times a year. One for Passover, one for the Feast of Weeks, and the third for the Feast of Tabernacles. It was an annual procession. The city of Jerusalem swelled with people who came to the holy city, Harold, to the capital city, to the place where the temple was, to worship. And on this particular entry into Jerusalem, they were coming to celebrate Passover. They were remembering the Exodus. The whole purpose of Passover is to reflect and to recall what God did to his chosen people, the Hebrews, the Jews, the Israelites, when they were in captivity in Egypt. It was God's rescuing, delivering, and releasing his people. And Passover speaks about God's demonstration of his punishment of Pharaoh and the Egyptians for their failure to worship Yahweh. Secondly, Passover calls attention to the fact God was showing how much he loved the people that not because of anything good they had done, but just because he had selected them and chosen to bless them and make them separate from every other nation and bless them if they continued to worship God. Passover showed how much God loved his people. People were traveling to Jerusalem to be involved in worship, to reflect, recall, and remember who God was and what God had done. They were from all walks of life and all areas. Actually, Jesus had been traveling to Jerusalem for three years, meaning that his whole life was focused on what would happen in Jerusalem. John's gospel tells us that Jesus went to Jerusalem every Passover during the three years of his ministry. Well, that would not surprise us. I told you every Jewish male was required to go to Jerusalem. You'd expect Jesus to have done that. Now think with me. That's why at the age of 12, he was there. His family had taken him to worship, celebrate Passover at 
age 12, and he was left behind. And his parents came back a few days later and found him teaching in the temple. Actually, just a little before this particular passage, it's recorded in Luke chapter 19. Jesus is journeying from the furthest he'd ever been north towards Jerusalem for the last time, and he came through Jericho. And at Jericho, he met a little man, a tax collector, Zacchaeus. I'll spare you the song, but you know it. And this little man's life was transformed, and he invited Jesus to his house. Jesus took some flack for eating with tax collectors and sinners. But it was at that meal in Zacchaeus' house that Jesus revealed his mission statement. Actually, I've been working on a mission statement. I've been retired for 12 years, and now I get to get back in the saddle again, and you have to put up with it. <coughs> but I've been... I, yeah, well, you might be clapping when I leave, too. <laughs> a mission statement helps you understand why the Lord gave you what your gifts are, why the Lord has allowed you to live this long, and what it is that the Lord wants you to do. I was struck when I was reading about Jesus' stopover on the way to Jerusalem in Jericho, and, and I, I discovered in Luke chapter 19 his mission statement. He says in response to the people asking, why are you in Zacchaeus' house? Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. That's why he was going to Jerusalem. We call it the triumphal entry. Nobody was waving proms and saying, hey, the triumphal entry. No, they were shouting something else. They were quoting Old Testament scripture. But Jesus was fulfilling his purpose and his mission statement for the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost means that you and I should be glad that was his purpose and that was his mission. And that's what he was doing. And it was bold and unashamedly and unafraid. Jesus had been traveling to Jerusalem. And now he knew what was ahead of him. I find it interesting that while Jesus was intentional, he had said many times, to people he'd healed, don't, don't make any fuss about this. Don't, don't, I don't want anybody to get overexcited. He was traveling on the way to Jerusalem when there was a group of people that gathered around and heard him teach. And the disciples said, Lord, it's getting late. Send them into town to get something to eat. And Jesus said, you feed them. They found a little boy with five loaves and two fishes. They fed 5,000 people was on the way to Jerusalem. Jesus knew where he was going and he knew what would happen. I find it hard to believe that all the people in this procession didn't understand it quite the way that Jesus did. Because on three separate occasions, Jesus told his disciples exactly what was going to happen in Jerusalem. And Matthew records all of them. In Matthew chapter 16, from the time from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and must suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Those verses are in red. The disciples heard him. They heard. They didn't understand. That wasn't enough. That was chapter 16 of Matthew. Chapter 17, not that much later. It's actually in 17, right after the transformation, transfiguration, when Jesus' body was transformed. 
not exactly like he's going to be transformed on Easter. And now Jesus again, the second time. If I ever tell you something the second time, it's because I don't think you heard me the first time. What was Jesus' motive? In chapter 17, when he said, when they came together in Galilee, he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. They heard him. They heard They didn't understand. Well, the Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of men. Did you hear that? They will kill him. Get that? And on the third day, he'll be raised to life. Joe, how many days? They heard. They didn't understand. Third time. Just before this, what we call triumphal entry, in Matthew chapter 20. Now, as Jesus was going to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside and said to them, we're going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and on the third day he will be raised to life. Unbelievable. They heard, but they didn't hear. They didn't understand. They had no idea what was going to happen as this procession moved joyfully into Jerusalem. They had been traveling, depending on where they lived, for some time. It was an annual event, and they were coming to remember what God had done to those people that he loved and how he had punished those that he didn't. And then Jesus, the sovereign orchestrator and designer, sent two disciples into the city to get a donkey. By the way, Matthew's the only gospel that mentions the donkey and the colt. And by the way, if you were reading and confused, he rode the colt, the, the young one. And the di- disciples put their cloaks on the young one. I read somewhere where somebody thought Jesus was actually riding both animals. That's, no. Young donkey, the foal. Matthew's the only one who records both of them. The, the other dis- uh, writers of the uh, Gospels just mentioned one donkey. He sovereignly planned this procession. Now, it's not going to surprise you that most of his life, Jesus walked. And he walked a lot. He did ride a boat. Well, he was walking on water, too. This is the only time that scriptures reveal Jesus rode. And I don't think it's significant the fact that he wrote. I'm, I think it's significant the fact that he made it a public display. Because prior to this, he had not wanted anyone to make uh, much about what he was doing because, and he would say it repeatedly, my time has not yet come. Well, on this Sunday, his time had not yet come. He had something to do and something fairly important to do. But his time was coming soon, and he knew it at the age of 33, fully aware, fully in control. And for us, the, it's important to recognize for the first time, he was willing to make this public in a city that in the previous Passover celebration, his family had said, don't go up. They're looking to do you harm. And he said, I won't go. And then later on went up and went quietly. This time it's a public procession. You can't mistake. And the people are excited. So the donkey is a fulfillment of scripture. And Jesus knew that actually Jesus is concerned about fulfilling Today, Palm Sunday, 
three Old Testament prophecies. In, in my calculations, there were 39 places that, in the Old Testament that predicted something that would happen that came true in Jesus, 39. Three of them are with this Palm Sunday triumphal entry procession. He knew Zechariah 9, 9. It's actually quoted in the Bible. I read it for you, but uh, let me go back to Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. That's a code word for Jerusalem, daughter of Zion. Regret, rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah 9, 9 almost 500 years before. Coincidence? And Jesus knew it. Hence the ride. He's also referring to Isaiah 62, verse 11. The Lord has made proclamation to the ends of the earth. Say to daughter Zion, see your Savior comes. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He knew that he was doing something to fulfill scripture and he wanted it fulfilled. So the sovereign orchestrator of what we've called the triumphal entry was fulfilling scripture. And the third one is Psalm 118, verse 25, 26. Lord, save us. You hear that in the Palm Sunday response of the people lord save us lord grant us success blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord for the house of the lord we bless you jesus was indicating he is the messiah and he was communicating what kind of messiah he was and it wasn't what the people of israel were hoping for most people expected the messiah to come hoped that he would come soon they knew the predictions but what they thought he would be would be a political or a military king and ruler. Someone who would come and overthrow the Roman oppression. Someone who would raise the banner of result, revolt and free them from the Roman tyranny. They were looking for someone who would rescue them and relieve them from the taxes and from the pressure and from all the soldiers. They were looking for the Messiah, but they were looking for the wrong kind of Messiah. But Jesus knew the kind of Messiah that he would be, the kind of Messiah that had been promised. Here's the one on a donkey, not a horse. That's what the military conquerors rode in on victory. On a donkey. That's a symbol of humility. David rode a, don a donkey. And humble and righteous. Yes, a king. Yes, the Messiah. But not the political revolutionary they were hoping and expecting. And Jesus, who said in Matthew chapter 11, my yoke upon you, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. He is a gentle Savior, touching, healing. You will find rest for your souls. Jesus was fulfilling prophecy. The people knew the prophecies, and so they joyfully participated in the procession. I want to call your attention that Matthew tells us there were two crowds. Actually, he did. It was a very large crowd, lots of people coming. Matthew says there was a crowd that went before him and a crowd that went after him. When I was in high school, I was uh, honor guard in the Beaver Falls High School band. We carried the flag. We, we led the procession. We led the parades. So we, we didn't know where we were going. We, we just started the parade out. The band director was watching along in the first line of the trumpets. He's the one that said, turn left, turn right. Jesus wasn't leading a parade. He was a participant in the parade. There was a group of people ahead of him and a group of people, two groups, and they were shouting and they were quoting, see to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of him. Hosanna to the highest. There was a great deal of excitement, enthusiasm. They were hopeful, they were expectant, they were celebrating, they were going to Jerusalem. There were two crowds, one that went before and one that went behind, shouting, Hosanna, waving palm branches. Some of them had put, put their cloaks on the road. The disciples had done that on the young foal. Others cut branches and laid them on the road. This was something that was typical in the celebration of a rival of a king or of a celebration in the palm branches, very familiar in 
the architecture, uh, jewelry uh, of uh, the Israelites. But if you read one of the other Gospels, it tells you that there was another crowd. And the other, other crowd was the people that were already in Jerusalem. And they saw the procession. And so they came out. So this mass of human beings, the people before Jesus and after Jesus, is now joined by the people coming out of the city and everybody singing and shouting. They can't all have believed that he was the Messiah. They, they had to have been thinking, he's, maybe he's going to save us. Maybe he's going to redeem us. Maybe he's going to rescue us. There was mixed emotions. There was insincerity. There were two crowds. One on Palm Sunday and one on Good Friday. And on Palm Sunday, they shouted, Hosanna. And on Good Friday, they shouted, crucify him. On Palm Sunday, the triumphal answer, they cited they shouted, Hosanna in the highest. Five days later, a crowd shouted for Barabbas. It calls our attention to the importance of being sincere in our worship. These people had heard the prophecies, but they didn't understand them. They they saw, they heard, they were aware. If you'd have been around Jesus, you'd have known that the people who couldn't see had their sight given back. The people that couldn't hear could hear. The people who had leprosy were cleansed. The people who were dead were raised. But not everyone was sincere in their celebration. And there were a lot of people in Jerusalem that were jealous, fearful. The religious leaders were concerned. That the Roman government's going to come in and shut this display down and take away all of our power and authority. Jesus was aware that in the large crowd, there would be people who misunderstood. But he continued. And when he entered the city, when the procession reached the gates. Matthew tells us the city was stirred. In Matthew chapter 2, when Jesus was born, the wise men came, said, we've come to see the new king. We want to worship him. Where is he? And Herod was concerned. And all, actually, let me read it for you. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. They were stirred. What, what is this? What, what's going on? And that's exactly the question they ask. What is this? Now, I'm a little confused. I doubt if anybody here would want to say, well, what is this? Isn't it obvious I mean, the people of Jerusalem who were looking at this procession, what had they missed? Well, were they clueless? Were they oblivious? Were, were they been living underneath a rock? Had they never been to Jerusalem? Who would ask, what is this? Well, actually, they ask, who is this? Who? Well, the people that were traveling with Jesus had no trouble answering that question. Well, let me, let me read their answer. This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. True. Accurate, but inadequate. This is Jesus, the prophet. The prophet? No word about Messiah. From Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? In Galilee? 
Did they not know where Nazareth was? You know, they were troubled. They were stirred. There was confusion. There was mixed emotions. There were people who were worshiping, and there were people who were wondering. There were people who were praising, and there were people who were puzzled. There were people who wanted to see Jesus become the the Messiah and King of the nation. There were other people that were wanting to kill him. Mixed emotions. How, how would you respond if you were in that procession and someone asked, who is this? Are you able to answer? Would you be able to tell anybody who Jesus is, who Jesus said he was, what Jesus came to do? I mean, you know a lot of facts, you know a lot of stories, a lot of parables. Would you have been able to answer a tad more accurately? Now, rest assured, I'm not going to ask you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I already embarrassed Joe to see if he could remember what three was. I, too, was surprised. (laughs) There is a second triumphal entry coming. And no one will need to ask, who is this? He will be coming in majesty and in glory. And just as the 39 prophecies of Jesus' first coming were clearly answered, some of them waiting over 500 years, the prophecies and the predictions of Jesus' second coming are just as surely to be answered. We don't know when. That will be the last Palm Sunday the last triumphal entry for all of us. And when he comes in that procession with the trumpet shout and sound of the angels, he's coming to capture and restore and renew everyone, but some for eternal joy, where we will see him face to face and sing our Palm Sunday songs with gusto. But there are others who are coming who are going to say, I wished I'd have paid more attention. I heard, but I didn't understand. I listened, but I didn't believe. That's the lesson of this Palm Sunday. The purpose of Matthew recording his gospel. Obviously, there were mixed emotions. And obviously, people are wondering why. And as I said to you before, something my father used to always remind me, everybody brings a little joy. Some in their coming and some in their going. On Palm Sunday, Jesus brought a lot of joy to a lot of people. But on Friday, five days later, his exit brought a lot of joy to some people who will be confused when he comes again. But come back next week and we'll talk about why we worship a cross and not an empty tomb. Arrest the king, crucify him, a good man leading people astray, wanting to make him king for the wrong reasons. The last Passover for Jesus began on what we call Palm Sunday, what we call the beginning of Holy Week. And it ended for him in the crucifixion on Friday. There are still two crowds. There are still people who come to worship and then people who choose to ignore, people who shout praises and people who question who is this. There are a number of clueless, unaware, uninformed people in the world today. But my question to you on this, our Palm Sunday, the one we get to celebrate, the one where we acknowledge the holy city, Harold, are you looking for the second triumphal entry? Are you living in the manner that the Lord and Master and Savior of the second triumphal entry has wanted us to live? Wanted you to live? Wanted your mission statement to include his priorities? It's actually a chain reaction. If you look to Jesus, And if you live for Jesus, 
then you will look more like Jesus. And you'll be ready whenever he comes. I attended a funeral service yesterday for a good friend of mine. He'd been on the board at Seneca Hills. He was 88 years old. He was a retired pastor, served one church for 35 years, something I wished I could have done. I wasn't allowed to do. He's with the Lord. The Lord called him home. His last Palm Sunday was last year. But he's singing praises, and no one would wish him back. The more you look to Jesus, the more you love Jesus, the more you live like Jesus. I'm glad you came. And while we're not going to, I don't know what we're going to, what were you going to do with these? (laughs) It is a symbol. Yeah, yeah, okay. You make them into a cross. Yeah, I don't know how to do that either. I really am confused. I said this morning, and I read the hymnal for all the Palm Sunday songs, which I can tell I know by heart. But even more important, I can't read music. Why did I look at the book? And what am I going to do with this? But it's a mnemonic. It's a reminder. I was here. I was reminded of what Jesus intended for us to know and understand and remember. Yes, it was the conclusion of his life, but he's alive today. Part two next Sunday. Might the Lord of Palm Sunday, the Lord of Easter Sunday, and the Lord of Christmas use what we know, what we've heard, what we can recall, what we can remember to focus our attention on how it is we might live and love and serve him. Would you pray with me? Father, Palm Sunday is a holiday in the life of the church. It's listed even on secular calendars. It's an opportunity for us to pause and And to focus on one particular point, one particular day in the life of our Lord. It's significant, and he knew it. His intention was to fulfill the prophecies. He knew them, and he wanted to to fulfill them. It was an object lesson. It was an opportunity for him to display to us in actions and in attitudes and in words the significance of what would happen. Yes, every night during Holy Week, he would return to Bethany and sleep, only to rise the next morning and come back for his final teachings and finally for what he knew, what he had promised, what he predicted, that he would be arrested, that he would be tried, that he would be convicted, condemned, and that he would be crucified. In accordance with his mission statement, he came to seek and to save the lost. That's who we were. Thank you that he fulfilled his mission. And thank you that today we have sung our praises and we've heard from Matthew's account of the details of what transpired on that holiday so long ago. Now, Father, throughout the course of this day, as we spend time with family, as we reflect on our morning worship, remind us of who Christ is And help us to remember he's coming again. And I pray, Lord, that for each of us who've gathered here this morning, he is coming for us. That someday we might sing our praises and our hosannas face to face in heaven. We'll thank and praise you in advance in Christ. Amen. The song, The Holy City, was written in... 1892, by Frederick Weatherly. 1892, you didn't know him. (laughs) How many years have you sung this, Howard? Harold? How many years have you sung this song? Let's make this 41. Lead us in worship. Okay, I got you.
Last night as I lay sleeping, I saw, came to dream so fair. I stood in old Jerusalem beside the temple there. I heard the children singing, and ever as they sang, he thought the voice of angels from heaven and answering. Me thought the voice of angels from heaven and answering. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, sing for grace and sin. changed, the streets no longer rang. Hush were the glad hosannas, the little children sang. The sun grew dark with a mystery, the morn was cold and chill. As a shadow of a cross arose upon a lonely hill, as a shadow And with that, may God, whose arms were spread on the cross to embrace the whole world, help us this week.
to take up the cross and follow him. Amen.